Now, we have this, uh, let's get, what was actually in the options right now? But basically, there's a little um, camera that I can turn on and make a movie of any part of the gameplay. Uh, when I click to save the movie, I have an option to post it directly to YouTube. So you can actually post any movie you make in the game directly to YouTube. So we're going to do a lot of things that are basically encouraging the players to tell stories. And I, maybe I should mention this just for a second. I think that there's a fundamental difference. Uh, I think play and storytelling are two fundamentally different things. I think they're both educational technologies that we developed evolutionarily, you know, to help teach, learn, abstract, build schema. Uh, I think a play is based really on agency, on you going and interacting with the system, observing cause and effect. Storytelling is really more based upon empathy, where you're looking at characters on the screen, you're kind of feeling, you know, their motivations, their emotions, etc. Now, uh, I find that there's a lot of confusion between storytelling and games. A lot of people doing games are talking about what's the story, you know, why am I here, what's the backstory, and we try to use uh, things like Hollywood and movies as the model for game design way too much. Uh, where games really should be more based upon what the players know. It should be player-focused, player-centric. The most interesting stories I've ever heard come from games aren't the ones that the game designer was trying to tell. They're the ones that the players are telling back to us. Oh, I started the game and I made this character and I did this and then this happened. And the players will tell you these amazing stories. And the more diverse their stories are, basically it implies a larger possibility space within the game. You know, if you look at a game that's more like an RPG like Zelda or something, everybody's going to get the sword at the same time and defeat the same wizard and go through the same basic path because that's what the game designer, you know, program the game as. And so, uh, to me, the most interesting stories coming from games are player stories. And so I'm really interested in making narratively rich environments where the largest possible diversity of stories can occur and then finding ways for those players to be able to easily share those stories with each other. Because, again, that's very motivational for players to do something really weird in the game that nobody else has done and then somehow record that and share it with other people. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder how you deal with the laws of physics in these games, or, or do you worry about that? I mean, you know, you go between the stars in a matter of a few seconds. Oh, yeah. Which is a little unrealistic, I mean, because, I mean, the spaceship must have some limitations. But on the other hand, you put in realistic, uh, you know, uh, nebula and, and, and various things from Hubble Space. Uh, telescope. Yeah. Uh, you know, what happens if, if I'm in my uh, spaceship and I get too close to a gas giant and I'm gravitationally captured? I mean, is there a possibility of, you know, ending in, 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 in well, a actually, collision with a, with a planet? That's a really good point. Um, you know, like the prototypes I was showing you before, where we were simulating, you know, much more realistic things like interstellar gas formation and stuff like that. Uh, you know, you know, I mean, we did like maybe 200 prototypes for this game. Of the 200 prototypes, we actually ended up using dynamics out of about 10 of those prototypes. You know, the prototypes there are generally for us to prune branches of the tree, to throw away parts of the simulation that we decide are not the, you know, the core, most fun, most interesting ones that can coexist with each other. And that's really key, is that what rule sets can coexist and you can kind of creep upon. Uh, like, a lot of times we will, you know, if we're not going to simulate something correctly, we will abstract it out to the level to where at least it's not uh, overtly incorrect. For instance, the star travel, yeah, but we're not saying how long it took. You know, yeah, if you think it's a build time, it might have been, you know, 5,000 years, you know. And there's not a, much of the game that really kind of goes back and reinforces the fact of how long the journey took you. Um, we had, the early prototypes actually, the very first uh, prototype I had of the galactic expansion, it was called Slow Space. And it was uh, actually based upon the assumption that there was no faster than light travel, and nothing could you know, probably ever go faster than maybe 10% the speed of light. And you know, we were actually trying to colonize the galaxy with those assumptions. And it was a very interesting strategy game, um, but it wasn't the kind of lighthearted, move around, explore, have fun, going on this grand tour of the universe. You know? And so at that point, you kind of have to say, okay, would I rather have them you know, very easily flow friction, explore the galaxy, and encounter all these cool things? Or have them sit there and, you know, you know, for hours and hours, put all their resources together to send one little ship across this giant gulf to another star, which is what reality would be. So this is definitely, you know, a situation where we bend reality. You know, sometimes we absolutely um, break reality to meet player expectations. In SimCity, one of the things we did was that uh, 
if you know fire is one of the common aspects of SimCity where occasionally a fire would break out and things would burn. If a fire had ever burned a nuclear power plant in SimCity, it would blow up, which of course they don't really do, you know. But players, you know, they were always expecting that, they want to see that. So <laughs> a lot of times we just try to meet the player expectations. And again, it's kind of a fine balance. You know, we'll go back and see in the manual if that didn't really happen. And most people will know it didn't really happen. But still, you have to kind of get that right balance. Because again, if you don't capture the motivational player, don't get them interested. You know, I'd rather break science a little bit here and there and have somebody play 100 hours rather than get all the science perfect and have them play for one hour. Because I think at the end of the day, you have to multiply those two numbers together. How much time did somebody spend and how valuable is the content? And that's the, you know, the sum of your kind of educational contribution. And I think far too many people aren't trying to maximize the volume side of that equation. Yeah? Were you able to use uh, standards for generating the, um, the plants? Uh, I, are you creating these all on the CPU, or do you actually get them on the graphics? The plants or the planets? The planets. The planets. See, the procedural generation that you're doing on any of the planets, creatures, and It's all on the client side. Um, yeah, the planet ones, we actually... Uh, it's interesting is that the planet brushes that are going into canyons and mountains and stuff like that were actually an evolution of the brushes that we were using to texture like the creatures and stuff. Um, and we also found that we're able to do so much more on the video card nowadays. It's actually pretty interesting how powerful these video cards have become. That uh, a lot of these effects, you know, for any pixel on screen, it's you know going to about ten filters of you know what colors the atmosphere, how much you know occlusion, what's the normal, and all that stuff. So uh, getting these dedicated graphics cards has gone a long way for us to be able. I can't begin to tell you kind of how complex it is to build a scene like this, as simple as this might look. Um, because this has to be playable at every scale, I have to be able to be all the way down to ground level, crawling around as a creature, but also pulling all the way out to space and have the thing render, you know, many frames a second. And then be able to deform the model in real time, you know, at any point. And that's a set of requirements that are, it's hard to get to coexist. Well, do we have any Martians yet? Any what? Any Martians yet? Oh, let's see. Oh yeah, we have a whole ecosystem up here. This is showing our food web. Um, we've got some carnivores and herbivores. <coughs> well, that's one of them. Okay. We got it, Dave. Uh, we can go around searching for them if you like. <laughs> it's hard for me to talk in front of you at the same time. Yeah, maybe if we sit here long enough, they might show up. Uh, there we go. Oh, they're there. Okay. Uh, questions? More questions? <laughs> You're, you're dumbstruck? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, just curious, what was the budget? Oh, we're north of 30 million at this point. Um, you know, which I know sounds like a high number. Uh, well, game, game goal, yeah, I mean, that, that's actually almost reasonable. Game goal nowadays, you know, game budgets have skyrocketed, you know, pretty similar to mid-level film budgets at this point. Um, we actually did this with a team that was about half the size of what's typically done for AAA titles now. Because of the fact that everything in the game is procedural, you know, most game teams right now, over half the game is content. Uh, artists making models, doing textures, et cetera, et cetera. Um, in addition to doing, you know, our art procedurally, all the planets, creatures, buildings, uh, about half of the music is procedural as well. Uh, depending on, you know, when you're creating a creature, that creature is actually generating a unique theme. We work with Brian Eno, he was doing our soundtrack, and he's done a lot of work with procedural music, and he never really had a format for it because he can't really sell procedural music on the CD. Um, and so, you know, he was really kind of frustrated that he loved doing procedural music, but there was no format, except games were like a perfect format for him. So, uh, and we actually have like little tools when you design your city, you get a little musical tool where you can actually um, regenerate new music within the city uh, based upon his algorithms. So, how many people are on the team? About 100. Yeah. Your comment about Brian Eno um, makes me think about uh, the the interplay between creativity, like artistic creativity, and scientific creativity, and and the the way that you are evoking creativity in in the game that you're creating. Yeah. Uh, and and just how I guess maybe if you could just talk a bit more about the thought process that went into uh, inspiring people to be creative. I mean, that's that's such a big part of what you're creating here. Yeah, I think the underlying thread to what you're saying is that um, it's actually amazing how very simple things, when they come together, 
can make surprising elaborate results depending on what, how you mix them. And this is kind of generally referred to as emergence. You know, in computer terms, it's the emergence. Very simple rules can emerge into very complex behavior. Uh, the same is actually true in some sense of art, music, and the tools that we're giving the players here. We want to give them the simplest set of tools that when combined, give them the widest set of possibility space that they're dealing with. You know? So there's this kind of ratio. How simple can the tool be? 